Hi, I'm Patrick Rapella, and welcome to Rapella TV. Today we have the pleasure of meeting with Chuck Horner. Thank you for being with us. Chuck's a retired four-star Air Force general and a combat pilot with over 5,300 hours of flying in a wide variety of fighter aircraft. He has a BA of Arts and an MBA and attended the War College. Chuck has served our country all over the globe for over 30 years, and one of his last roles, he was in command of all U.S. and Allied air assets during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. During the Desert Shield phase of the conflict, Chuck briefly served as Commander-in-Chief, forward of U.S. Central Command, while General Schwarzkopf was still in the United States. Chuck served at every level, including as the Commander-in-Chief of North American Aerospace Defense and the U.S. Space Command. During this period, he was responsible for the aerospace defense of the United States and Canada and the exploitation and control of space for national purposes through a far-flung network of satellites and ground stations throughout the world. Chuck's also a New York Times best-selling author of Every Man a Tiger, written in partnership with best-selling novelist Tom Clancy. We're here to learn about Chuck's interviewing, hiring, and leadership skills and experiences. And Chuck, again, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you, Patrick. Chuck, as I understand it in the Air Force, you aren't classically interviewed for promotions or necessarily to get hired for a job per se, but I'm sure you've gone on a lot of interviews or for other reasons been asked to talk about your expertise and your skill in, in regards to promotion. Could you tell us about the best experiences you've had where you were personally interviewed? When you get selected to become a wing commander, which is a big deal in the Air Force, it usually leads to being promoted to general if you do it successfully. You have to go interview with the major command commander. In this case, it was Bill Creech. And that was a very difficult interview because Creech was a very demanding individual. But uh, certainly I was very, very nervous going in there. But he asked hard questions, but they were easy to answer. For example, he asked me, what, what talent do you have that makes you least likely to be a good wing commander? And I said, personally, I'm shy. I grew up on a farm, and it's difficult for me to talk to people. But I know I have to do that as a commander, so I'll get over it. I'll have to do it. And uh, that interview went very well, and it turned out later that uh, General Creech uh, kept me around and gave me big jobs at, again and again and again. So I guess I was passing his test uh, even after the interview. Probably the most fun interview I ever had was when uh, Colin Powell was going to retire. They had to interview who's going to be the next uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Mm -hmm. And Senator Inouye was selected. He came around and he came to me and it's supposedly just a very visit. I knew him very well. And uh, we were riding in the car, and he said, well, what do you think about becoming the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? And I said, sir, you don't want me to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'm a warrior. I'm not a politician. And I would not be successful in the Washington arena. Mm -hmm. And he started laughing. And then he said, you should hear. And he told me all the interviews he'd been given to all these people who were trying mm -hmm. to uh, ingratiate themselves sure. to get the job. Mm -hmm. And he said, they're so silly. They don't understand. Just be yourself. Yeah. So uh, that was probably the best advice, and I give that out often. Excellent, excellent. Um, now give me an example of what you might think was the worst experience you ever had being interviewed and how you wish you might have handled it differently or why it was the worst. Probably the most difficult experience I had is when uh, you get promoted to your third star, you have to go interview with Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, uh, the Secretary was out, so I went with the Deputy Secretary of Defense, mm -hmm. whose uh, grandfather had been a presidential candidate. He was a very well-connected and a very intelligent individual, but his eyes were not coordinated. Mm -hmm. So one eye, they call it, I guess, a wandering eye. Mm -hmm. Well, here I am, I'm on the edge of my chair, and I'm trying to decide, which eye do I look into? <laughs> <laughs> and that drove me up the wall. Sure. That made it difficult. Uh, but I've never really had any uh, uh, bad interviews because I just normally just be myself and tell the truth. Excellent. Okay. Now let's look at it from the other person's point of view, those that you had to interview. Um, what would you tell us about the best experience that you ever had where you were interviewing others, individuals for specific roles or opportunities? Well, in the military, uh, you do interview, for example, as the numbered Air Force commander, I interviewed all the squadron commanders and wing commanders that were going to be assigned. But we have an excellent uh, selection process. So generally, those interviews were n not pass-fail. They could be if the uh -huh. individual really uh, showed that he was not fit for command. But generally, this process doesn't put those kind of people before me. Right. 
So we really used uh, those sessions more for counseling, mm -hmm. for uh, sharing experiences, uh, sharing the failures I had as a commander with them so they wouldn't make the same mistake, mm -hmm. things of this nature. So uh, that's the kind of interviews that are most important in the military. Excellent. Okay. All right. So I'm sure you'll have no problem remembering the worst experience you have ever had were um, you interviewed candidates, but are there any examples, uh, any experiences where you had really bad, you know, interviews? Well, the hardest thing I ever had to do was fire somebody. Mm -hmm. And so you bring them in and sit down and talk to them. So that interview is really a termination interview. Kind of that exit termination. Exit yeah, termination. Yeah. And uh, those are not pleasant. Mm -hmm. uh, often I would uh, try and make sure the individual understood that, that they weren't failures. It's just that they were in the wrong position for their particular talents. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, if they had done something illegal or immoral, then we didn't have an exit interview. Mm -hmm. But uh, this was to people who were just not doing as well as they needed to do, and I, the op my obligation was to the people that worked for them, not mm -hmm. necessarily to them. Mm -hmm. And that was tough. Okay. All right. Well, I know you were in the Air Force for many years, and you were responsible during a good portion of that uh, period for leading teams or uh, large groups of people. Can you tell us about the best experience you had where you were leading a team? Why, you know, why was it a great experience? What about it was you know, exciting or unique? Well, uh, leading teams is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You get things done through other people. And it doesn't matter whether your team is one other person or uh, 50,000 or 100,000 or 500,000 mm -hmm. people. Uh, the responsibilities are the same. The techniques are the same. The uh, dedication is the same. Uh, but I guess the best experience is when you have a huge challenge. And there's two such uh, events in my life. One was when I took over the wing at Nellis Air Force Base. We were transitioning from old F-4s to brand new F-16s. We were changing the mission from a, a purely training mission to one where we had to pass a number of uh, European exercises mm -hmm. because we were dual based. We were tasked to go there. And so in the course of the year, we swapped out all the airplanes. We swapped out most of the people. Uh, we took six uh, readiness exercises, which are pass-fail, mm -hmm. to include a nuclear surety exercise. And uh, we did it all while winning the, uh, the uh, best gunnery team in, in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. We did it all by uh, not having an accident. And uh, so I guess the pride we all got from having the huge challenge and meeting it was that. Right. And, of course, uh, the highlight of my career is when we deployed to Saudi Arabia in 1990. Uh, Twenty-seven divisions on the border ready to poise to attack us. We mm -hmm. had two armored car companies to defend us, mm -hmm. and we had to build a force in place uh, rapidly and uh, then go on to win a war. So mm -hmm. uh, the thing that makes great experiences as a leader is having great challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no question about it. Great challenges make you tougher, smarter, and a better leader, no doubt. All right, well, it's uh, time to spill the beans. Now, this is one of these uh, you know, questions where uh, we all have challenges throughout our careers, like you just mentioned, uh, and you know, especially as leaders, some really bad experiences that don't, that don't go the way we wished or had planned. Any examples that you can think of? Sure. Uh, the worst I've ever felt is as a wing commander or as a director of operations when we'd have a fatal training accident. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself, what didn't I do that I should have done that would have precluded that accident? Because the lives are lost. Right. And that life has value. And so you got to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And so uh, as a leader, it's incumbent upon you to accept responsibility, even though it's very easy to say, well, uh, the generator broke or the, mm -hmm. uh, they had a fire in the engine or something like that. It doesn't matter. You have to accept responsibility. And, of course, the thing that really bothered me during the Gulf War was what am I not doing that's going to result in somebody getting killed? What, mm -hmm. what do I need to preclude somebody from getting killed by the enemy? Right. And uh, that's the heaviest burden you carry as a leader in the military is the danger, the present danger, even in peacetime, of what do you need to do to mitigate the hazards your people face. Yeah, I yeah, understand. Because the parents, they don't want to hear about what caused the problem. Mm -hmm. They just want to know that somebody's responsible. So, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, in your many years of leading people, what qualities really stand out in a person and make you want to pick them for a specialized task, promotion, or to lead other teams? 
The thing I always looked for in people was first selflessness. You have to be dedicated to the mission. Uh, the mission is so important. It is so uh, critical that you be dedicated to what you're doing when you're in the military. And I'm sure the same is true in business. Sure. You have an obligation to all the people that work for you in business. Uh, the other thing, we uh, have absolutely honesty. And honesty means if you don't know the answer to something, you say, I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. You don't shade the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't try and make yourself look good by uh, uh, ingratiating yourself with your leader. Mm -hmm. If you think your leader's doing something wrong, you owe it to him, tell him to. Mm -hmm. So there's that problem. And, of course, the thing that makes it all work, and it's uh, Marshall asked Eisenhower one time, and he said, what do you look for in a good commander? And he said, courage. Uh, courage to do the right thing, courage to even put yourself in bad light because you made a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fundamental. And uh, I do, never really look for knowledge because anybody can gain knowledge. I do look for experience. If you have people that have never made a mistake, they probably have never tried. Mm -hmm. So experience is important, but knowledge is not so important. So the idea that so-and-so's got so many degrees of this and that and everything, uh, it's useful if you're a technician, but if you're a leader, uh, you can get it from someplace. Very good, very good. As you were promoted up through the ranks, what were the qualities that enabled you to get promoted and that others might want to develop in their careers? Anything more you'd add to that? Well, in, uh, in your fighter pilot, the first requirement you have is to survive. Mm -hmm. And out of my uh, gunnery class of 17 students, I think uh, nine of us were dead in the first three years, mm -hmm. to give you an idea of the problems. So, right. Uh, then the other thing is I stayed around, so dedication. Mm -hmm. uh, and every time they go to have to promote somebody in my year group, well, I was the only one around because mm -hmm. I was the only one, last man standing. So survivability and uh, dedication are awfully important. I think uh, also uh, you have to have faith in something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't face big challenges and think you're going to solve the problems. Uh, when I deployed to Saudi Arabia, and Schwarzkopf went back to the States, and uh, the Secretary of Defense turned to me and says, you know, you got it. I thought, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. It's too big. It's too, uh, I, I'm incapable. And then I realized that, no, it's not up to me to do everything. It's up to me to do the best I can. Right. And I have to have faith in something larger than myself. And that's proved to be fundamental for me over and over again. It gives you the courage to continue even when you don't think you can fail. Or, you can make it done. Amen. Excellent. If you had to do your career over again, are there certain things that come to mind that you might do differently and or, uh, you know, that you wish you had done like that? Uh, can you give me some examples like that? Well, I had a, a great boss when I was in the Pentagon named Bill Kirk, mm -hmm. and he taught me something really important. He taught me to take joy in some benefits occurring to somebody else. Okay. Before, we were so competitive. Fighter pilots are extremely competitive. Mm -hmm. So if somebody else got promoted and I didn't get promoted, I, it caused me to feel not anger, but necessarily a jealousy, or envy. Okay. And that's such a waste. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill Kirk, uh, when something good happened to somebody else, he'd always applaud and think that was the most wonderful thing in the world. And I saw the benefit that that has for you. Mm -hmm. And we all have a path. Mm -hmm. We all have something that's going to happen to us, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. So we better get used to letting it happen and, and accepting what it is, and take joy when good things happen to other people. And I guess the biggest failure I have in my life is my uh, dedication to my job, the nature of my job, uh, made me not pay attention to my family as I should have. As it turned out, I have a wonderful wife, and my kids all turned out okay, mm -hmm. although several times I thought about having them put to sleep, <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, but quite frankly, uh, I think that it's important, no matter where you are, that you stop and pay attention to your family, uh, the raising your children, um, telling your wife you love her now and then. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, the demands of our businesses, the demands of our military, yeah. all work against that. So no doubt. that's something you have to have in the back of your mind. Yeah, whether it's the military or the corporate world, the travel and the constant uh, pressures of work can often get in the way of the family, and you've right. got to make sure you know that. That's, that's got to be managed, too. Well, thanks, Chuck. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you, Patrick. Up.